Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. These are tough times in South Africa. Officially, COVID has taken more than 55,000 lives. Researchers reckon the real figure is much higher. And right now, there are fears of a third wave of infection. But many minds in the ruling party are consumed not by this national health and economic crisis, but by ANC infighting and mudslinging over corruption and accountability. My guest is Finance Minister Tito Mboweni. Has the ANC lost the plot? Tito Mboweni in Limpopo province. Welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, I've been here before on Hard Talk, uh, but those days I was at the studios in London. This time I'm speaking to you from Mahobaskluf in Limpopo province. Thank you very much indeed. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you on, on the program, Minister. Last time you were with us on Hard Talk, of course, none of us had heard of COVID-19. Now your country is still in the grip of a national crisis thanks to the pandemic. How damaging in that context is it that the ruling ANC is so riven with division about issues of corruption, particularly concerning your former president, Jacob Zuma? The most important thing for us in South Africa at the moment is to make sure that the entire population understands the interventions that were to put in place to fight against the pandemic. Uh, basic non-pharmaceutical interventions and then obviously the rollout of the vaccine now. But the basic non-pharmaceutical interventions are important. That's the first thing. The second thing at the political level, you're asking me the question about the fight against corruption. Uh, the African National Congress, the governing party, is uh, very resolute in its determination to fight against corruption, irrespective of whence it comes. And therefore, whoever is involved in corruption must know that the, the, the law will be after them. And that's what we're doing, irrespective of who they are. And right. how well, that, high that, 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 and that, which office they mm. once held doesn't matter. That, you all must face the, the wrath of the law. That's a very important opening statement you've made, irrespective of who they are, you say. So let us turn right now to the case of Jacob Zuma. He is facing court trial on charges of corruption, which involve, what, two and a half billion US dollars. Now, Mr. Zuma is still a member of the ANC. So a very basic question, is it now time that he was suspended or maybe even expelled from your party? I think you have to ask that question from the official spokespersons of the party. But what I know is that there's a basic um, po political decision within the party that if you are charged for fraud or corruption before a court of law, you must step aside from your official position. Now, that's the position, for example, that's confronting the Secretary General of the ANC. He has had to step aside. And that's a basic fundamental framework under which we operate. We have to be very strict and very direct about things like this. Many post-liberation parties fall into difficulties because they fail to maintain the basic principles of, uh, of the revolution, if I may put it that way. Well, so, you're, yes, so you're, therefore, you're, 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 hang on, hang on. Let, let's try and keep this really concise. What you've just said suggests to me you think Zuma should be suspended right now. We know that he recently attended a National Executive Committee meeting of the ANC. He is still very much operational inside your party. So why isn't your party acting? I think you need to ask that question from the uh, Deputy Secretary General of the ANC and not from the Minister of Finance. 
And let me ask you this. How real is the possibility of what, in essence, would be a civil war inside your party? You refer to the now suspended Secretary General of the ANC, Ace Magashule, who faces his own very serious corruption charges. He said last week, when the trial of Zuma was adjourned, he said, Zuma must be supported at all times as ANC leaders. That's how we were brought up. There were hundreds of demonstrators outside the court at the time of the adjournment who said that they would do anything necessary to defend Jacob Zuma. Your party could tear itself apart. I am I'm very confident that the African National Congress will stay together, uh, united, those good people those men and women of the African National Congress will stay together. Over the years, the African National Congress has faced many difficulties um, from 1955, 59, 1969, and so on. I'm a member of the National Executive Committee of the ANC, and I'm quite convinced that the majority of members of the National Executive Committee will keep the party together. Um, and those who want to disobey the decisions of the National Executive Committee will find themselves uh, out of the door by their own volition and by their own deeds. Just another thought about the ANC. Your own fellow countrymen and women, they want to know that your government is truly focused on the crisis you're facing, but they know that uh, Jacob Zuma and Ace Magashuli are going to be facing trial. And they know that both men deny all of the very serious charges. They know this could run on for a long time. I just wonder whether you accept the words of William Gumedi, the, the chairman of a, a big NGO in your country, Democracy Works, who says that this has become a battle for the soul of the ANC, particularly the fate of Zuma. Do you, as a senior member of your party, agree with that? I know William Zuma uh, Gomez for a long time. He has been saying that for the past 20 years. It's not a new expression he has used. Um, so uh, I, I don't think there's any battle for the soul of the ANC. Uh, the ANC's soul is intact. When we look at the allegations, uh, particularly those around Mr. Zuma, they involve tens of billions of dollars going into uh, corrupt deals, what's been called generally state capture, the scale of the corruption. Now, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, your boss, your president, says that the governing party could and should have done more to prevent corruption in years gone by. Is that enough? Or do you, people, senior people like you and him, need to be much more frank with the public about your own failings to deliver clean governance? We, we are determined to make sure that the rule of law in the Republic of South Africa holds the ground. So anybody who faces fraud and corruption charges must face the, the law. They must go to court, explain their case, respond to the uh, uh, prosecution's case, and then the judge must determine whether they're guilty or not. South Africa is a law-governed society, and anybody who is accused of any wrongdoing must appear before the court, whether he's the Minister of Finance or he's the President of the Republic, it doesn't matter, or whether you're a retired military general or whatever the case might be. You, if you're accused and the prosecutorial authorities have a case against you, you must go to court and answer irrespective of who you are. So on a personal basis, you know him very well. How disappointed are you with Jacob Zuma, not least right now, his determination to fight all of this and to use any method he can, frankly, to, to try to uh, avoid uh, going to court and having this trial take place? Because, of course, his, his uh, defence team got it adjourned last week. Well, I've worked with the, uh, Mr. Zuma for many years. In fact, I think as early as uh, 1982, thereabout. So I've known him for many years. And um, from Lesotho, from 
uh, Maputo in Mozambique, from uh, London, um, from Lusaka. And I think that uh, all that he needs to do is to subject himself to the court processes and prove his innocence there. Um, and I think that uh, as somebody who has been in the struggle for so many years, I'm sure he's interested in the protection of our constitutional democracy, the rule of law, and that he will subject himself to a fair process of the law. That's very important. And so also, if he does that, it becomes an example of how leadership conducts itself when confronted with such difficult matters. This is important for future generations uh, as well, so that the future generations know that all of us abide by the law and that none of us is above the law. You yourself have been heavily criticised by people inside the ANC and also the affiliated trade union movement, COSATU, because of the way you've spoken out on financial governance issues, not so much in South Africa, but there was some infamous tweets you made about the uh, relationship between the president of Zambia and the chief of his central bank. And as a result of those uh, comments you made, Kusatu in particular called you a national liability. They seem to think you should be removed from office. Do you have a personal problem now with some of the key figures in your own ruling party and the trade union movement? Uh, not at all. Not at all. Um, I have very close working relationships with uh, uh, members of the National Executive Committee of the ANC, um, the General Secretary of COSATU, and also the other leaders in COSATU, the leaders of the South African Communist Party. We have differences from time to time. And I think one thing that's very unique about me if I might just say something about myself, I call a spade a spade and not a big spoon. And if you call a spade a spade, you are going to get into trouble from time to time. But I like and, and enjoy getting in trouble. <laughs> well, it, nice. all right. In the in the, the in the spirit, is, yeah, Minister. Is, yeah. In the spirit of calling a spade a spade, I hope mm. perhaps you'll be very frank with me about why your government has failed to really effectively find ways of controlling COVID-19. Because three of your key provinces are now facing a very dangerous third wave. It looks like a fourth province is about to declare that it's in the third wave of COVID-19, and your death toll is far higher than any other country in Africa. Why have you failed? Well, one of the things about South Africa is that we don't hide our statistics. Uh, we say things the way they are. I'm sure if you d dug deeper into uh, the statistics of many other countries, you're going to find so many hidden facts. We don't hide facts. When we look at the way the pandemic has affected the whole world, all of us should be talking about how we join hands together to fight the pandemic. And in South Africa, we have now begun the process to roll out the, the vaccine. In fact, uh, I'm going to be vaccinated um, uh, very soon. Um, uh, I've been told that because I'm over 60, um, this time has come for the over 60 people to be vaccinated. I, I, I'm, I'm, de I'm genuinely delighted to hear that you're about to get vaccinated, but the trouble is you will then be a part of the roughly 1% of your population that has received a, a dose of vaccine. Your vaccination rollout has not been as fast as, say, Senegal, Ghana, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Botswana. You are the richest nation in the continent of Africa. I come back to the basic question, why are you failing? Well, we're not failing at all. We have got very strict health regulatory um, uh, uh, requirements in South Africa. We began with the uh, AstraZeneca uh, dose, then it didn't work in South Africa. We had to donate that or hand it over or sell it to other African what, countries. What, what do you mean it didn't and, work, Minister? Well, what, what do you mean it didn't work? 
because the, 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 a certain variant had developed in South Africa and the AstraZeneca from the Serum Institute could not work. And then we had to rely on the J&J &J and also the Pfizer uh, vaccine doses. And you know the problems with the J&J, &J, I can't talk about that because I'll get into legal problems. But now we've got the Pfizer um, doses in South Africa. And it's the Pfizer one, for example, that I'm going to be um, jabbed with. Yeah, but, uh, but I'm, looking and, at a, uh, I'm, look, I'm looking at a quote oh, here no, from no, Professor no, no, Shabir, no, no. Professor Shabir <laughs> Madi, who was involved in the AstraZeneca trials. He says <clears throat> that stopping the rollout of AstraZeneca in your country was a mistake because it does undoubtedly, he says, protect against severe disease, even if it doesn't protect against getting mild symptoms and selling our Astra Va AstraZeneca vaccines to other countries was a miscalculation, one that has set us back months in our vaccine rollout. D do you regret it now? I think you need to have a conversation with the Minister of Health. Let's talk then the economic costs of COVID-19. The unemployment rate in your country is shockingly high, particularly for young people. It's I think it's uh, if you include those who have given up looking for work, the unemployment rate is well over 40 percent. Now, uh, what are you actually offering the hardest hit people in South Africa in terms of real support? I think the most important uh, <clears throat> uh, interventions that we know um, throughout history um, is to provide an environment which makes economic agents uh, to be active. So this government interventions as an economic uh, agent on one side, but also private agents and private enterprise. And the most important parts of this story is the working relationship between the public sector and the private sector um, in the provision of employment or employment opportunities, contracts which create jobs and uh, other economic activities. And the so-called animal spirits uh, in the economic debate is very important. And I think uh, we should not be in the mood of what are you offering people? Or what kind of an environment are you providing for both the public sector and the private sector to engage in economic activity. Well, you, yeah, you, you, you yeah. might focus on animal spirits and getting the private sector moving, but the, the reality is that millions of South Africans, poorest South Africans, have seen you offer them a below inflation rise in their social grants, while at the same time you're cutting corporate taxes and talking about fiscal prudence. So many in your country feel that you're favouring business and ignoring the needs of those who are truly suffering from co the COVID pandemic and the economic crisis? Uh, Stephen, Stephen, uh, basic economics, economics 101, will uh, tell you that uh, providing incentives for business companies to operate is actually a job creator and not a job dis destroyer. So if, as a business person, you, you know that you're going to receive a tax benefit in the future, the tendency is for you to increase your, your, your economic activity. In fact, to employ more people. This is what the uh, Kosatu Trade Union Federation said of your budget in February. They said, Mr. Mbawini has delivered a budget that has not for the 14 million people or more of working age who are unemployed. They feel that you are basically looking after the private sector at the expense of the unemployed and the poorest South Africans. Politically, for the ANC, that is a very dangerous place to be. That is their view, <clears throat> which I don't agree with, but that's their view. But politically, that's not where you need to be. If your own allies who have been with you in the struggle for decades now believe that you're a guy who's looking after the interests of big business and not the poor, politicians like Julius Malema and many others are going to make huge political capital. Uh, uh, they could as well very well do that. But that's their view. That's their view. I disagree with them, but that's their view. 
It's a risk you're taking, Minister. I take risks every day. And if it doesn't work, and if this unemployment rate of, as I say, the real unemployment rate of 40% plus persists, you and your government surely will lose the confidence of the people of your country. You, you know, um, I was in the government uh, of President Mandela in 1994 through to 1998. Then I went to the central bank to become a central bank governor. And then after that, I went to the private sector. And the structural unemployment rate in South Africa has remained elevated. It's got nothing to do with the February budget. Uh, anybody who thinks that it has to do with the February budget really um, must have their mind uh, examined. Um, the structural nature of unemployment in South Africa has to do with the structural changes in the South African economy. And the, the, the fact that uh, the, the primary sector, i.e. agriculture, uh, mining, uh, have changed. Even the manufacturing sector has changed. So agriculture and mining, for example, each one contributes about 5% to share of GDP. And the manufacturing, both light manufacturing and heavy manufacturing, are about 18% of GDP. The rest of it is the tertiary sector whether it's wholesale trade, retail trade, banking and finance, insurance, domestic services, government services, health services, that's where the thing right. is. But, but and the... therefore, no, 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 let me finish. And therefore, the skills set required for this structurally changed economy um, is what we need to work on so that we feed into the pipeline the skills which are now required in light manufacturing and also in the tertiary sector of the economy. Right, but you've, you've, had oh. ye you've had years of low growth, you've had years of stagnation, infrastructure problems, and in recent times, recession. Claude Besac, who r runs, the, yeah. runs the Unimix oh. consultancy yeah. group in Johannesburg, he says, barring a meaningful tra change of trajectory in South Africa, it will become a failed state by 2030. Can you fix that? trajectory yourself that's, that's absolute nonsense that's absolute nonsense south africa will never be a failed state that's nonsense that's nonsensical but can you turn around what you've acknowledged to be this unemployment crisis the unemployment but i've explained to you what the problem is and um, I, I have no other words to explain to you the, the fact of the matter is that this country south africa has found stronger institutions that keep the, the, the country together, the pillars of the state together, whether it's the judiciary, whether it's the central bank, whether it's the national treasury, whether it's the defense force, the intelligence services, whether it's the uh, non-governmental organizations, whether it's chambers of commerce and uh, academic institutions, this country is far more stronger than any one of them on their own, put together. All right. So there's no way in which South Africa is going to collapse. It's not possible. That's nonsensical. Well, Minister Tito Mbaweni, I thank you very much indeed for joining me on Hard Talk. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for having me here. It's my second time here, and this time it was more difficult than before. <laughs> well, we appreciate it. Thank you very much.